talking about uh, hearing from God and communicating with God, I want you to, you know, as we go through this, uh, be listening to him. Because what he has to say is far more important than what I have to say. I might say something that will put a thought in your mind, and God will finish it out and maybe round it out and give you more information. So those are the things you need to be writing down. Uh, yeah, like Andy said on the, the uh, PowerPoint and all that, we can send you that without a problem. But I can't send you what God's going to speak to you. So write it down. Let, uh, let him use this opportunity to teach you something. One of the greatest hindrances to uh, communicating with God are people with busy, busy minds. Melancholy mind is someone that thinks and always replays the past like an old movie. And if you don't get an understanding that you can make your mind work for you, uh, your mind will lead you around and, uh, well, it leads you into trouble, but it doesn't have the power to get you out of trouble. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5 is uh, talking about the responsibility that you and I carry for dealing with the thoughts of your mind and making your mind behave. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Strongholds are those excuses we make to pretty much stay the way they are, excuses we make to justify who we are and what we are, even when we know we're not what we should be. For casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And the arguments that he's talking about are those thoughts that continue to go through your mind over and over and over. He's not talking about arguments you're having with your neighbors. He's talking about the argument that's going on in your mind. And um, then verse, the, verse 6 goes on to say, or the last part of verse 5 says, bringing every thought into captivity. There's the responsibility God has given you and I. The responsibility of taking captive our thoughts. Now, taking captive a thought is as simple as this. It says taking captive every thought and bringing it into the obedience of Christ. Looking up those words that uh, help you see what the root really is talking about. Bringing something into the obedience of Christ is from a... It paints a picture of a person listening and obeying a commander. Uh, and so really what it's talking about is very simply this. When you begin to have these thoughts that constantly run away in your mind. Some people have thoughts they think are just, oh, this is of the devil. No, it's not of the devil. It's just your mind. It's your mind working. You've never made your mind be quiet. And the thoughts, you just need to begin to speak those thoughts to God, to the Lord. Jesus, where are these thoughts about whatever I'm dealing with? Where are they coming from? What's going on? Bringing those thoughts into captivity and bringing them to the obedience of God, to the obedience of Christ, means you're capturing those thoughts, you're communicating with God, and He will give you a word that will stop them or help you understand what's going on in your mind. But the key is making your mind work for you instead of allowing it to continue to work against you. Do you realize that your mind is it always, the Bible says, Romans 8, 7, your mind is at enmity with God, a carnal mind, a fleshly mind, is at enmity with God. In other words, your brain is going to constantly work against God. And that was a revelation that came to me years ago, and I recognized, oh my gosh, my mind is what's creating in me depression. That's the cause of depression. And so I recognized that the mind was doing its own thing. A melancholy mind, for instance, is a very powerful mind. If you've got minds that can recall the past with living color, and if you think a lot and think very deeply, and, and if, you're, if you're kind of like Pastor Andy, who, who is a very deep thinker, that's a melancholy mind. It's a very powerful mind. But a powerful mind that's not controlled will control you. In other words, if you don't bring that mind under subjection to the spirit that's in that you are. See, you're not flesh. What you see isn't who you are. It's what you're living in. Your spirit, man, needs to take the responsibility. Once you've become born again, the spirit of God lives in you. Your spirit's alive. Now you have the power to override everything the flesh was, is naturally doing. And one thing the flesh is naturally doing is your mind is running the show. And you need to begin to make your mind be still. 
It's possible to go through life with a, with a quiet mind, not thinking all the time. Um, I had one lady say to me, how in the world am I supposed to bring every thought into captivity and talk to God about it? And I said, you're supposed to do it. Those thoughts, talk to him. Well, some time passed and I met her again and she said, I'm amazed at how quiet my mind is. She said, I, I only had to talk to him a couple times about a couple thoughts that were really bothering me. Bothering me. And, he, and she said, from that point on, my mind has been relatively quiet. I can go through a whole day without just letting my mind run and run and run. I, I, try, to, I try to make my mind be still so that I don't have thoughts going on in my mind. People think that, well, isn't that kind of a mindless way to go through life? No, it's a way to go through life always ready to hear from God. God can speak to me at any moment because I'm not allowing my mind to get carried away. Right. When you have a busy mind, God has no place to speak to. He doesn't speak into the ear. He speaks into the mind. So if your mind is busy, he's got, he's got no palette to paint on. He's got no speaker to speak into. And so you've got to make your mind be quiet. And that's a big, 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 big hindrance to many, many people trying to hear from God. I would suggest any time you ask God a question, you don't hear an answer. It's because your mind is busy. Your mind gets to searching. Your mind gets to thinking. Make it be still. Now, here's how I teach people how to make their mind be quiet. I tell everybody, just sit still and close your eyes. And don't allow your mind to entertain any thoughts. Try that right now. Close your eyes. And just, I'm going to keep speaking to you. You have the capacity to take in input without entertaining thoughts. If your mind wants to go thinking about something and look for something, or if your mind is questioning you, what's that mean? Just in your mind say, nope, we're not going there. And you make your mind be still. At first, your mind will wrestle with you. But after you hold it steady for a while and don't allow it to entertain those thoughts, it'll give in, and you'll feel it kind of like settle in. Whew, just, it'll just relax and settle in. And when, when that happens, your mind's at peace. Now, that's the way you're supposed to go through life. A quiet mind. Not t tossed and torn by all the thoughts and everything. And in that case, when you're, setting, when you're going through life with this quiet mind like this, you are totally open and ready to receive from God. And it's wonderful how many times through the day He'll speak to you. He'll lead you and guide you. It's like Isaiah said, you'll hear a voice behind you, turn right or turn left. That's really how detailed God wants to be able to lead and guide our life. I tell people that you make your mind be still, kind of like you try to, what you do when you go to sleep. Don't you? When you go to sleep, don't you close your eyes and don't you make your mind be still? Because if you don't, you lay there and that mind runs. You'll never get to sleep. Probably why you don't sleep very well. But if you if you just lay there and make your mind be quiet, your body will relax, everything, you'll go to sleep, and your mind will be under total control. So, that's the problem. If you don't know how to keep your mind still, that's something you've got to begin to practice. Another hindrance to communication with God is uh, th this busyness always leads us to depression. That's what causes depression. A depression is when something settles in or sinks in. A depression in man's mind is, called, is inward thinking. Always thinking about the issues of your life. That's a depression. And uh, your mind uh, allowing yourself to do that will always bring you into bad news. It'll always take you down. Never does it fail. It'll take you down. James 1, what's 17 and 18? Okay, yeah, here's, here's what you can expect from God. If, you're th if you've got bad news going on in your mind all the time, you're not hearing from God. Here's what you hear from God. Every good and perfect gift comes, um, is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he bought us, brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now that word of truth he's talking about is by his spoken word, by his interaction with us. Everything that comes from God is good. God has the capacity to chastise you and make you glad he did. He never belittles or berates you. Right. He always encourages and builds you up even when he's correcting you. Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9, I call this 
this is, this is the, the litmus test for what we should allow our minds to think on. Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Look at this, what it says. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, if anything's of good report, if anything is virtue to it, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate or think on these things only. So you see, there's the litmus test for what we need to be helping control our mind. If anything is pure, lovely, admirable, praiseworthy, honorable, if anything's of good report, think on those thoughts, he says. And uh, there was a period of years in my life when my mind was doing its own thing and I was depressed most of the time. And I, I, I read that scripture and began to pull that thing together and thinking, my goodness gracious, nothing I'm thinking about is pure, lovely, admirable, praiseworthy, or honorable, or of any good report at all. And so I began to apply this litmus test to what my mind was doing, and I found out I really didn't have anything to think about. I, I had no reason to let my mind run at all, because it was just tearing me down. That's the cause of depression. Dixie and I, over the years of helping hurting people, we've helped many, many, many people whip depression with no medication at all. Medication really doesn't help whip anything. Medication just numbs you. But the real treat and the real trick to getting rid of depression is to control your mind. Making your mind be still. I have a whole class at Teen Challenge on just making your mind be quiet. It's not an official class, but I, I teach it every day. <laughs> People can't hear from God, can't hear from God, I just ask them to. Quiet your mind, let's hear from God. And the moment I can help them get their mind quiet, they hear from God immediately, mm -hmm. instantly. They have no problem with it. Another hindrance to communication with God is your mind always wants this control. Romans 8, 7 talks about your mind, the carnal mind of man, which means the fleshly organ of called your brain, is at enmity with God. In other words, it's totally going to work against God for two reasons. Number one, it's flesh. And number two, it was trained by the enemy. What do we mean by trained by the enemy? Well, the world system in which we live has pretty much developed the thought processes that we have. And uh, the Bible says, James 4.4, 4, if any man is, becomes a friend with the world, he's an enemy with God. So we, we're allowing the enemy of, our, of, of God to really control our mind. That's why once you're born again, the Spirit of God lives in you, you really don't have a whole lot to think about. You really Now, if you're going to balance your checkbook... If you're going to deal with that kind of thing, yeah, you need to think about that, of course. But when it comes to just living life and dealing with life issues and dealing with relationships, you really don't have a lot to think about. And the less you think and the less you, and the more you make your mind be still, the more you're open for God's instructions and uh, the less depressed and the happier you'll be, for sure. God desires for us, James 4, 6, or James 4, verses 5 and 6, talks about, um, where was it? I had it right here a second ago. Let's look at it again. James chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Do you think that Scripture says in vain that the Spirit, uh, the Spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but He gives more grace? Therefore He says, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. What am I talking about there? God's desire for us. Oh yeah, to humble yourself. Here's the, here's the problem when I'm dealing with people, dealing with issues of life. People say, I, 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 I know where that's coming from. I know what's going on. I know what's going on in my life. My response to that is, well then fix it. Why would you allow that terrible feeling, that terrible thing to go on in your life? If you know where it's coming from, fix it. Well, the, the response is, I don't know how to fix it. Well, I guarantee people, you don't know where it's from either. You don't know what really is going on in your mind to know what's causing these emotional pains and the details of your life that's causing you to, to struggle. And uh, it, so we help a person humble themselves. Here's the thing. If you don't humble yourself before God, you'll never receive anything from God. What does it mean to humble yourself before God? To humble yourself in my, in my book is this, in my understanding is this, in my life, 
To humble myself means I'm willing to admit that I don't know everything yet. Just that simple. And that's not hard to do. Do you know everything? You know, I mean, anytime you think you know everything, well, you got a problem. Uh, <laughs> there's more we don't know than, <laughs> than man knows. And so if you can just get to the understanding that I really don't know everything yet, and therefore I really don't know what's going on in my life most of the time, that's humbling yourself before God. God's desire for us is that we humble ourselves. Take our control and let go of it. It's been our, our control and the situation, situations of our life that we think we have to control and we have to constantly keep our hands on. That's really it's usually the source of the difficulties, the source of the struggles of life. So God's desire for us is that we humble ourselves. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it's not I, but it's Christ in me that lives. It's Christ in me that lives. He loved me, died for me. And the life that I now live in this flesh, I live by faith. So that's the desire God has for us, is that we live by faith and trust Him. Trust Him to lead us and to guide us. Trust Him to give us the wisdom we need. I uh, was talking to Andy about this the other night, last night. and He was mentioning how God is making his job so easy. And uh, my last secular job was working for county government. And God literally did my job for the last three or four years of my time there. Uh, I, had no, I was given a job that was impossible. Nobody knew anything about it. Nobody was willing to give me any input. And uh, I had nobody to rely on but God. And uh, God literally did my job. If you want to know what he did, we'll get genuine Christianity and read about it. It's in there. How God literally did my job and led me through it and, and, and helped correct problems and brought people's names to my mind that I didn't even know who they were. And I get to investigating who that person was and I found out, oh, that's a person that's the head of this department and that was something I needed to talk to, somebody I needed to talk to about an issue. God is amazing if you just clear your mind and allow him to lead and guide and control your life. And that's what this whole thing about effective communication. That's the reason we need to be effectively communicating with God. Mm -hmm. So that he can literally lead and guide and control our life. Um, and the whole thing about is about trusting God. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Right there is scriptural proof that God doesn't want us to think about it all the time. No. The world tells you to think about it. Well... Why? When you got God, will give you the answers. Good a man like wisdom, let him ask God, who gives, a, who gives generously without finding fault. So we need to learn to really cast the cares of our life onto God and just really allow God to control our lives, uh, speaking to us and directing us and so forth. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Give up total control. Let him have it. Uh, your control is going to just cause... Problems. Another problem with hindrance communication is unable to stimulate communication with people. There are a lot of people who have a hard time communicating. People who are in their mind thinking all the time don't really communicate all that well. So a, a primary question I reach, uh, I have with a lot of people, or a lot of people that I deal with, they don't know what to talk to, talk to God about. What do you have to talk to God about? I mean, think about it. We're going to be talking to God. He's the creator of heaven and earth. When we go to him, we ought to have something to say. Or we ought to have a question to ask, right? So what do you talk to God? How do you stimulate your questions? How do you stimulate communication with God? I found that it's very easy to stimulate communication with God if I just talk to him every day about what I'm feeling. If I'm having a good day, I walk to work and I've got this long lane that's beautiful, trees and I walk to work and I'm just thanking God all the way of, about the beauty of where I live and what he's doing through my life. And I'm talking to God. I'm just, I'm just thanking him. Why? I feel good. There are times when I, uh, if I have walked to work and I've got a particular problem I'm dealing with, I'll talk to him about that. I'll, I'll tell him what I'm feeling. God, I don't understand. I'm confused and I don't even know why I'm confused. God, what's going on? And I'll allow him to begin to feed me information as I'm walking to work. And... Uh, so you, you need to just, when the Bible says pray continuously, what it's talking about is talk to God about everything. 
You get into a habit of talking to God. See, that's, that's how we whip addictions. We trade the habit of worry and fretting and stewing and depression and then drug use. We trade that habit for the habit of always talking to God about everything you feel. And that's what whips drug use. Because once you find out that God really wants to communicate and that He can make you feel good and, all, and, and bring you into a life of peace, shoot, that makes life simple. Because you can live that way all the time. And uh, nobody wants to be addicted to things and controlled by substances. And uh, a, a, a lot of the world has this wrong conception of people who are on drugs that they just want to be that way. No, they don't. They're dealing with their emotional pain. They're dealing with the feelings of life they can't control and they don't understand. And uh, you go to a doctor and talk about the feelings of life, what are they going to do? They're going to give you drugs. They're going to give you pills. But there's a better way. And it all has to do with clearing your mind, and communicating with God, and not allowing yourself to take control over your life again. So, how do, we, how do we talk to God? How do we spark communication? We ask questions. We talk about what we're, what we're feeling. Another, another problem, a uh, hindrance of communication with God, is that sometimes we talk, 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 and we never give God a chance to, to speak in, to step in. Like this bird says, do you think I talk too much? I mean, people say I talk too much, but I don't think I talk too much. Do you think I talk too much? Do I talk a lot? I don't talk any more than a lot of people do. <laughs> so it's kind of the way we talk to God. I hear people in their prayers when they when there's public prayer and they talk to God. My goodness gracious, they spend most of their time telling God what He already knows. Well, God, you know how we're trying, we're doing this, we're doing that. He don't need to be told what He already knows. You know, it says in, in Hebrews 4.13 that the eyes of God's upon us and we must, he's the one we'll give account to and he sees everything. And so why are we spending a lot of time talk, talk, talk and not really spending any time just asking the question? Prayer time, when people tell me, well, I'm praying about it. Have you dealing with this issue? Well, I'm praying about it. My response to that is, what's God saying? Well, well I haven't heard from God on it yet. Well, then you're not praying about it. You're just talking at God. You're not communicating with Him. See, prayer is communication with, f between us and the divine. Right. Communication is two-way. It's not just one way. And so when we just talk, 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 and not receive anything back from God, we're wasting a lot of time, aren't we? The key and the reason to go to God is to get what we can't do on our own. The Bible says you have not because you ask not, not because you think not or anything else. Speak to God in as few words as possible. Here's a trick that I've learned a long time ago that when I'm hurting or I'm dealing with an issue, I speak to God in as few words as possible. I ask the most specific questions I can. Okay? Um, why am I hurting? Why, wh where's this feeling coming from? That's the main thing I ask God anymore. If I'm dealing with, if I'm just, you know, how, sometimes you get up in the morning and you just don't feel right. Anybody ever do that here? They do that in Minnesota. They do it in Iowa. Sometimes I'll get up in the morning and I'm just like, kind of like they say you get up on the wrong side of the bed or something. Well, I've learned to ask God about what in the world is this about? You know, what's going on? In my, and, and, and God will always, if not give me an answer, bring me peace. He will always put peace on me. But when you talk to God, be as specific as you can. I tell people always to sharpen the point of their question. If you're not getting an answer from God, rethink what you're asking Him and sharpen the point of that question. And the way you sharpen the point of a question is you ask yourself why questions. I'm feeling this way. Why am I feeling this way? Or ask God, why am I feeling this way? And if God says, because you're disturbed with something. Well, why, why am I disturbed? What is it to... What's going on? See, we don't really know what's really going on in our head most of the time. No. All we know is we're responding to feelings. Life is a constant response, reflexive action, based on the feelings of our life. And so if we learn to recognize that the feelings that are driving us really need to be identified, and God needs to be the one that identifies them, then we can specifically ask God questions. Why am I feeling what am I feeling? Why am I... Why am I doing this? Why am I feeling this way? Why am I angry? Anybody ever get angry and really don't know why? 
Why am I angry? Why am I upset right now, God? He has all the answers. He'll, he'll tell you exactly why. But be specific. Use as few words as possible. Don't drone on and on and on like I am right now. Don't talk on and on and on. <laughs> be specific. All right? Ask questions. I just said that. Ask questions. You know what it means to cast your cares on God? I hear people praying, well, Lord, we just thank you for these meetings, or we thank you for this, whatever we're doing. We say, we cast the care of it on you in Jesus' name. Well, that's not casting the care on anything. That's telling God that, that's telling God what he told you to do. How does a care present itself? A care presents itself to us in a feeling, right? Cares are bad feelings. Well, how do we cast that care onto him? We tell him how we're feeling. Simple. God, right now I'm upset and I'm confused and I don't understand it. That's casting that care of why, what, what I'm feeling onto the Lord. Right. And then we ask questions. And the, the most important question I teach the guys at Teen Challenge to ask is, God, where is this feeling coming from? He'll always show you what's in your mind, where it stems, what's causing this this upheaval in your life. Uh, the, the picture I put up there is, you know, a, a kid that feels worthless, dumb, and bad, and lazy, and so forth and so on. We all have those feelings hit us occasionally. Mm -hmm. There's things in your mind that's being triggered on a constant basis where you one time believed that's what you were. I'm dumb, I'm stupid, I'm lazy, whatever it is. Well, God will identify exactly where those places are if you ask him. If you tell him what you're feeling, ask him. Sometimes I don't even know what I'm feeling. I just don't. I just know it's not peaceful. And so I just ask God, Lord, I just don't know why I'm feeling this way. Would you just give me your peace? Now, if there's anything I need to know, Lord, just speak it to me. I'll, I'll receive it. But if, if it's just a passing bad breeze, just give me peace, Lord. And he does. He does. That's what Philippians 4, 6 talks about. Be anxious for nothing. But in all things, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and mind. Yep. And that's the key. What we're looking for is a life filled with peace. Peace, quietness, and contentment. Right. Amen. Amen. Whoops, another shameless advertisement. <laughs> now, <laughs> we're going to talk about and get into the area of what his voice sounds like. How do we detect what his voice? This is a big topic in most places because people are expecting, ooh, this audible sound or something to come from. And the Lord spoke to me years ago when I asked him, I said, God, why don't you just speak in <laughs> some way that I can't miss it? You know, why do I always have to? Because this is when I was learning to sort through my thoughts and is that you, God, or is that me? And all the questions that everybody always has. And God spoke something to me that's very important. He said, I will not compete with the noise of the world. Huh. Now I want to tell you, and if you stop and think about it, think about it this way. If God spoke audible to us, and he's speaking to all of us right now, that would be kind of a confusing time, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yes. If he's speaking to everybody, boy, how confusing would that be? And if, and if the world figured out God was speaking to him audible, the world noise would just get louder, which means God would have to get louder. Yeah. You ever been in a room where there's a lot of people... Yep. And there's a lot of conversations going on, and it just keeps escalating and escalating. Pretty soon it's so loud you can't hear yourself think. Well, that's the way it would be if God spoke. What's that? Mosquitoes are like that. Mosquitoes are like that. Oh, man, up here, that's for sure. <laughs> but but when, God, when, when God speaks to us, he doesn't speak audible, of course. He speaks directly into our minds. Look at 1 Kings with me. Here, I love this part of Scripture. It's... Uh, Describes so well what we can expect. First Kings nineteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, verses eleven, twelve. Just look at this. This was Elijah as he was dealing with God. God was dealing with Elijah. Then he said, "Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord." And behold, the Lord passed by with a great strong wind, and a great strong wind of tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in an earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, 
was a still, small voice. So it was when Elijah heard that he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out, and he stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him and said, Now hear, now hear what he said. What are you doing here, Elijah? That's God. Still, small voice. And look how he talked to Elijah, just like a friend. Yeah. What, are you, what are you doing here, Elijah? I mean, God asked what? I mean, I'm sure God knew, but think about that. God <laughs> asks and talks to us just the way we speak. And I'm always telling people they're expecting this rafter-rattling, earth-shattering uh, event when God speaks to them. And it's never that. It's always just a very quiet, subtle, quiet voice. And he always speaks to you just the way you and I would speak to each other as a friend. So, is God capable of speaking audible? Yeah. I'm sure he is. And I've had a couple occasions when I tell you it was so clear that I swear it was audible. But the problem is, I was the only one there. And I wouldn't swear to it that it was audible, but it seemed like it was audible. So was it audible? I don't know. But it was certainly clear what God was trying to get through to me. <coughs> so I'm sure he's able to speak audible. As a matter of fact, I think he spoke audible to Jesus. Remember him when he went into the water and was baptized and the Spirit of God came and said, I mean, and the Father said, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. The Bible says that many heard it, but many thought it was thunder. Many said, oh, that was angels. Well... It was God the Father speaking to his son, speaking to the crowd. So I imagine there was a coming a time when we'll all hear God's audible voice. Kind of looking forward to that day myself. Yeah. It comes to you as an inner knowing. Just suddenly. Now here's, here's what I want to talk, uh, talk about. Sometimes we don't get words. Sometimes God's very specific. Like the revelations that I read to you this morning about how to walk in love. <clears throat> That came to me in those words exactly. But there are many times when you'll ask God a question and you'll just know. There'll just be an answer. Right. You have to put the words to it to articulate it. God doesn't. It's just a knowing that comes. Um, like a great idea. Like the light bulb comes on, see? I think most of our great ideas are all God-inspired, to be quite honest. But it's a complete understanding without all the words to explain it. A lot of times we'll tell people that if, if, uh, if you're talking to God, uh, if you feel like you have to push the answer away, you're asking a question, but there's an answer there. I mean, there's, a, there's a, an answer, but you almost have to push it away in order to complete the question. That's happened to me on several occasions. And when I stop and listen, and I think, God, was that you or was that my mind? I have to settle on the fact that it was God because uh, when God speaks, when he gives you an answer, it'll always bring you peace even though in your mind it might not make total sense at the time. God's asked me to do some things that did not make sense mentally or as far as human, humanly making sense. But in my heart I had great peace with it. But uh, when God speaks, there's always peace involved. And I always ask people, what do you sense, see, or feel? When you're, when you're dealing with God, I always ask people to close their eyes because basically that just shuts out the distractions of the world around them. Right. And sometimes just the movement of somebody will distract the whole thing and your mind will go crazy. Mm -hmm. So shut your eyes. And then I ask them to tell me, what, what are they sensing, what are they seeing, or what are they feeling? A lot of times that will be a way that God communicates. God will communicate through pictures. A lot of times he will bring back to your mind a memory or a time gone by that was, and that picture will tell you something. It'll either bring you peace or it'll instruct you in some fashion. God can speak to you that way. Uh, and, and in a flash of a second, God can put something in you that it takes pages upon pages to, to verbalize. Uh -huh. So what, And that's what I call, what do you sense? What are you sensing? What do you sense? What do you see? What do you feel? Those are all methods of those are all questions you ask yourself when you're communicating with God. What is this sensing? What am I sensing? What's going on here? You know, uh, what, what do I see? What do I see in my mind's eye? God will use those pictures and he'll use those feelings a lot of times to, to help communicate a point or communicate direction to us. There are times when he gives a specific, exact, 
precise words. But there are other times when it's just really kind of a sensing or a knowing. But you've got to be again to pick up on that. If you begin to recognize when God's giving you these senses or these knowings, these sudden knowledge comes and I don't know where it came from. Well, it came from God if it's good stuff. <coughs> You begin, to send, you begin to pick up on that. You begin to thank God for it. You begin to deal with him and recognize that, wow, this was, this was from heaven. You know? Then you, be, you become more sensitive. You become more sensitive the more you begin to communicate with God. Right. You become less sensitive when you begin to doubt it. That's what God calls hardening your heart. When you doubt what you hear was from God. When you don't believe what you hear. I have people say, I'll tell them, well, I just don't know if it's me or God. Well, let's put it this way. Number one, were you asking a question? Number two, did the answer come after you asked the question? Well, then who was you asking? Was you asking you or was you asking God? Well, I was asking God. Well, then guess where it came from? Another, another thing that we'll ask people when they're, when they're saying, I don't know if it's me or God, does it bring you peace? Some people will say, well, all I see is a memory. All I see is a picture. Well, my question is, what does that picture tell you? There will be a message in that picture. Um... All these things are methods to begin to pick up on what God is instructing. I think God uses all these methods of instructing us or leading us to draw us deeper and deeper and deeper. His goal is for us to diligently seek after Him. That's God's goal. The more we right. seek after Him, the more freedom He has to interact with us. And so therefore He draws us. Sometimes God will answer a question with, a, with something that raises a question. Many times when dealing with people, uh, they'll tell me what God says to them, and I'll say, does that answer your question, or does that raise a question? Well, that raises a question. Well, then ask the question. Don't ever go away from communicating with God with a question in your mind. It's God's purpose to answer the questions and to solve the mysteries of our life, not to raise questions and leave us confused. Remember, God's not the author of confusion. I tell people, if there's confusion going on, it's in your mind. It's your mind that's doing it. God will never create confusion. No. He may raise a question. If he does, ask the question. These are, just, these are just thoughts to always consider when you think about talking with God. The more you begin to recognize what he's doing, the more sensitive you become, and the clearer your communication will be, begin to be with him. Here's just a method I use to explain God's voice. They're inner thoughts, not a part of your thinking processes. Just sudden words appear, sudden thoughts appear, sudden information appears. That's not a part of my thought process. In other words, I wasn't thinking and musing on anything. It's just information that comes. Words coming into our mind as the answer, as the answer to a question, for instance. Many times we discharge these thoughts as just wishful thinking. I had, uh, I've had several people who will say, well, I just, I say, what are you sensing? What's going on in your mind? Well, same thing I always have. I say, well, what is that? Well, it's just, it's just, I love you. And I said, don't you think that could be from God? Yeah. Where else would that be? Do you, do you tell yourself you love yourself all the time? Is that your own mind going, man, I love you. Larry, I love you. I love you so much, Larry. You know, I really, you know that's kind of weird. But, but when, when, when you draw people's mind to it, it suddenly begins to make some sense. Yeah. Wow. God was telling me I love you, for instance. Something simple like that, yet very powerful. So the inner thoughts that's not a part of your thinking processes is God. When I, when I tell people to, to explain to God what you're feeling, few words as possible, well, God, I feel angry right now, or whatever it is, I tell them now the next words in your mind will be God's response. And I've had people argue with, well, that, it can't be the way it always is, is it? No, that's the way it always is. I've been talking to God for a long time. He's been talking to me. I've been helping people understand how to communicate with God for a long time. I've been dealing with a lot of hurting people for a long time. And that's always the way it is. When you ask a question, the next thoughts into your mind is his answer. Right. Period. Now, if it raises a question, ask the question. I even sometimes, I'll, I'll, I'll tell somebody, well, ask God, was that you or was that my mind? 
if a thought comes that could be could be either one, I say, well, ask him. Was that you, God, or was that my mind? And uh, they'll always get a response. It was your mind or it was me. Very simple. God's answers are always very straightforward and very simple. Mm -hmm. Inner thoughts. What's his voice sound like? An answer that comes while we're asking the question. That's what I tried to describe a little bit ago. If you're asking a question, but this, this idea, this thought comes, but you've got to push it back in order to articulate your question. Most generally, you're pushing back the answer that God already has for you. So he already knows the question before you ever articulate it. So many times, most of the time, I would say probably most of the time in my condition, in my experience, that has been God's answer. And I'll go with it. And I and, and look at it this way. The Bible says, John chapter 10, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice. It doesn't say my sheep might hear my voice. It doesn't say my sheep will learn to hear my voice. He says, My sheep hear my voice. Right. And the enemies they run from. A very, a very um, fact, matter of fact, my sheep hear my voice. Well, now it's God's responsibility to speak to his sheep. Now think about it. If those answers come, those thoughts are there, the part, not, not a part of your, their thought processes, or if you're pushing back an answer, trying to ask a question, you've got to take a step of faith and say, God, I'm going to take this as your answer. And if it's not, you have the responsibility. You can help me. You can change me. You can, you can show me where I erred. Yeah. And he always will. If you're having faith that it's God and you really want to follow God, he will always show you where you've erred if you have. But I want to tell you this. In all the years I've been communicating with God, I don't know that I've ever missed it. Does that sound prideful? No. I just think it's that simple. I think that's God's capacity, not mine. It's God's capacity to always get to me. Yeah. And he has the same capacity for you as well, see. So if you begin to build that faith, that faith will begin to build the more you communicate with God. It's like, I, when I ask a question, I expect an answer. And when I talk to God, I expect he's always going to respond. And I help people see that by just having them, have, having them, just just close your eyes for a second. I want I want to try something with you. I just want to close your eyes, make your mind be still. Just just don't entertain the thoughts. Tell your mind hush. Take authority over that brain. And then I want you to say with your lips, "Jesus, I love you." Jesus. Now the next thoughts back into your mind will be his response. Tell me what he says. What? What did he say? I love you too. I love you too. He showed you a picture. What was the picture? Um, a crayon with a baby in it. Yeah. Which, what, what does that tell you? What's that message? He loves you. He, loves you. he, sent, he sent his son for you. What else did he say? What did he say to you? I got a picture of a flame, and it made me feel warm and cozy. Cool. Cool. Repeat that by yourself. Oh, he, you, you saw a picture of... A flame that made you feel warm and comforted and fuzzy, and and you and he said, what 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 was it he showed you? He showed me a cradle with a baby. In it. A cradle with a baby in it. Sure, the manger scene, right? What did he say to you, Bobby? He said, "I love you too." I love you too. See, he will always respond if we give him the moments. Every time I say, "Good morning, Lord, I love you," he says, "Good morning, Larry, I love you too." Always. If my wife, if I, if I say Dixie, to Dixie, I love you, you know, and she goes off like she never heard me, I'm like, <laughs> hey, you know, what do we expect? We expect responses from our loved ones. You think God's going to do any less? We've got to begin to hear those. And so when I, when I help people begin to recognize God's always actively speaking and always actively inter engaging with us, those are the simple things that I have them, I, I have them go through. I say, just practice Practice hearing from God. Just stop sometime and say, God, Jesus, I love you very much. <coughs> and I said the next words into your mind will be his response. He'll always have a response. Even if you just say, good morning, Lord. He'll tell you, good morning. Make him that personal. Begin to recognize he's that close and that desirous to communicate with you. And you can practice with a lot of things. I've had, uh, I've had people I've ministered to or an audience people. I say, yeah, well, just close your eyes. We'll do it here too. Why not? 
Close your eyes. Make your mind be quiet again, please. Just hush your mind. And I want you to say, Lord, out loud, I want you to say, Lord, do you have something to say to me? Now I want you to begin to tell me what he says. Did I always have something to say to you? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Pay attention. Pay attention. Yeah. I've got a picture of my wife. Uh oh. Better call. <laughs> Better call home. <laughs> what do you say, girls? Guys? Bobby, what do you say? What do you, you show? My creation. You are my creation. You are my creation. What do you say to you, Michelle Lashier? <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. Okay. He will always respond to you. I've had people in an audience go like, you got to be kidding me. He actually spoke to me. He said, yes, I have, I have revelations to reveal. All kinds of wonderful things he'll say. But there's always a response God will, will bring to you. And those are the ways you begin to practice hearing his voice. Begin to practice that interaction, that verbal communication with him. What do you want to tell me, Lord? You know, I mean, what revelation do you want to reveal? Ask him those questions. Begin to spend some time. I love to spend time, quiet time with God, merely to strike up a conversation. Some people say, well, I don't know what to do with my devotional time. I never know what scripture to read. I never know what. I always tell them, well, then don't worry about it. Leave your Bibles, lay on the end table, and just talk to him. Mm -hmm. What do you mean talk to him? What do I talk about? Well, how about talking to him about what he's got to say to you? Well, I haven't asked a question. Well, then ask a question. What do you got to say to me, Lord? Good morning, Lord. I want to hear your voice. See, he longs for you to long to hear his voice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, when you does anybody in here ever loved anybody? Yeah. I mean, really loved anybody? I don't mean me. I mean, really loved people? <laughs> you know, if you had a loved one, you had a husband or a wife, and, and, you, and you first met that person, and, and you just, what'd you do? You just couldn't wait to hear from them. You wanted them to call you. You wanted them to talk to you. They were always waiting for you to call them. That's a love relationship that Jesus wants to have with you and I. A very real love relationship. I can't wait to hear from him next. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to hear what he has to say to me next. He's always going to say nice things about me, so why wouldn't I want to hear him? Yeah. Same with you. He'll always have nice things to say about you. He'll always have wisdom that goes beyond anything the world can tell you. Yeah. So practice hearing his voice by just really making those affirming comments and questions to God, giving him that opportunity to speak to you. And that's how you begin to pick up on what that voice, that still small voice that Elijah was talking about. Just quietly he'll, he'll speak to you and he'll say things to you that will bring a chuckle to you. He makes me laugh quite a lot. Just because of the way he responds to my lack of faith sometimes. What his voice sounds like, seeing God in all your circumstances. Here's something we've got to begin to see. Remember what Jesus said in John? He said, the son can do nothing of himself. He can only do what he sees the father doing. Mm -hmm. Now, Jesus was in flesh and blood and bone body just like ours. Lived on this earth. He didn't have that connection. The only connection he had to heaven was through the Holy Spirit, just like you and I do. Said in Philippians that he gave up all the godliness. He gave up that that right to be God. He didn't consider it something to hang on to as he walked on this earth. Because if he'd have had that special God power, then what he did on the cross wouldn't have been any real sacrifice at all. <coughs> but he watched what God was doing. Have you noticed? Have you ever seen God begin to move on somebody? Have you, begin, have you, have you ever communicated with somebody and all of a sudden... You might have made one common statement, just a statement of fact, and tears filled their eyes, or something began to move them emotionally. See, you're beginning to notice what God is doing. And Jesus always looked for what the Father was doing, and then he joined the Father in whatever it was he was doing. And that's, that's something you and I've got to begin to look for. I always ask God, Lord, show me where you're working. Help me follow you, join you in what you're doing. You learn to listen more with the inside ear than you do the outside ear. If you stop and think about it, the majority of the information that comes into your outside ear is more confusing and just more noise. Yeah. 
The real peace, the real life, the real instruction, the real joy comes from that inner quiet voice when God speaks. So you learn to be more inside-minded than outside-minded. When we're trained by the world, you're trained to pay attention physically and to listen and think. And, and God says, relax. I've got much to say. I've got wisdom you have no other way of finding out except come to me. And I know things that nobody else on earth knows. You want to be light, year, light years ahead of the world? Then begin to listen and walk with God. And he'll give you revelations that will help you and deal with your life in ways, just like he taught me about how the subconscious mind works when science didn't even think there was a subconscious mind. And now they're saying the same things I say. And that's exciting to me. The science caught up with me. Anyway, God's always going to take you out there on the cutting edge. Listen more with the inside physical ear than you do the outside. Become more inside-minded than outside-minded. What does his voice sound like? Scriptures? I, I, I've had many times when reading the scripture... Just reading a, a passage, for whatever the reason, maybe just reading. I try to read 66 books a year. Uh, I have a process where I read through the whole Bible every year. And many times I'll be reading, and all of a sudden, something I'm reading just kind of is illuminated or steps off the yeah. page. You know, I had that experience? Uh -huh. That's God. That's God speaking to us through his word. Raises up, catches our attention. Somehow he hooks us with this information in the scriptures. I've read the same scriptures through I don't know how many times over the years. But every time I go back through the Bible, something new grasps, grabs me. That's God. We've got to begin to recognize he can use his scripture. He will use his scripture if we read his scripture. Yeah. Yeah? So, but it's not the only way he communicates. That's the beautiful thing about it. So uh, that's another way that he'll communicate and, and help us. And then, of course, through memories, he'll show you pictures of your past. He'll show you the memories of your life. He'll help you recognize uh, what has gone on so that you understand why things are dealing, feeling what they're feeling right now. So there's many ways God's voice will continue to help you, and you've got to begin to pick up on it. You've got to begin. We all, if we're going to really effectively communicate with God, we need to understand all these nuances of how he speaks to us. He uses all of this, these different ways to bring us to, bring us to attention and to help us see uh, him in, light, in, in, in the world around us. And, and uh, when you begin to recognize that, you realize how close your walk with him becomes. And then you become, when you're peaceful and quiet-minded, God will be able to use you in really wonderful ways. I've always had the habit of asking God what to do next in situations where I was confused. I've, I've been doing that since God got my attention and captured me 30-some years ago. And because I've never assumed I knew anything, I knew how to fix something or deal with something, God has always had me in positions and places where I didn't know what to do. So I would ask him, and he'd speak to me, and I'd obey what he says. And when that's, I've been privileged to allow God to use me to raise two dead people. Those, that's a trip. You ought to do that sometime, Yeah. It was God's idea to raise him from the dead. I didn't know what to do. It was a dead man. What do I do? I'm praying for the family. How do you pray for a man that's dead? He hadn't had any brain waves for 38 hours. He's dead. He's just laying there. They're going to harvest his organs, so they kept his lungs and stuff breathing. So they're going to unplug him and har harvest his organs. That's what they call it. It's harvest time. So they gather the body. They gather the family around. And this was a guy that overdosed on drugs and died and I didn't know what to do. How do you pray for a family in a condition like that? How do you pray for them, especially when the family don't give a rip about God? What do you do? Well, I just, I just asked God. And when we gathered around the body just before they ushered us out and slid him into the operating room, I heard these words. Bind the death angel. Call life into Dennis's body. So I just said those very words. Death angel, I, I obey. Death angel, I bind you in Jesus' name. And I call life into Dennis's body. And a dead man sits straight up. 
scared me, almost killed me. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. I didn't stop and think, well, what if, what if I say that and nothing happens? I didn't stop and think that way. I've just gotten accustomed to doing what I believe God says to do and to speak what he tells me to speak because I've learned to take all these things that God uses to catch my attention and I've allowed him to teach me how to walk with him through life, through struggles and peace and bad times and good times. And God will use you in wonderful, wonderful ways. I've been, I've been, and I know I've asked God, why, why would two dead people, why don't we do that every week, Lord? Mm -hmm. and why, why me? Why, why did you allow me to do that? He says, Cause, you know what he said? Because you were there. Because you were there. Well, I said, why did, why did you raise him from the dead? And his response was, I wanted him to live. <laughs> oh, that was good. That was really good. But he also said, and it also built your faith. I've seen healings and wonderful things. And I've seen, I, I tell people this. I said, well, don't call me if you got somebody dead and you wanted to raise. I said, that's God's job. I said, I've, I've prayed for a lot more people that I buried than I ever have seen raised from the dead. But the key is, what I'm trying to get across is, if you become familiar with the, with the various ways God communicates with you, you're setting yourself up as a tool through which He can flow. You see, God never accomplishes anything on the earth without going through mankind. And He never accomplishes anything on earth without it becoming the part of the spoken word. You speak it. He created by the spoken word. He raises the dead by the spoken word. Look at Jesus. He walked up to the grave of, 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 of Lazarus. What did he say? God, you always hear me. And God spoke. And he said, Lazarus, come out. And what happened? Came Lazarus came out. See, everything Jesus did, he spoke. You take a look at the, you take a look at the old, old prophets. Elijah, Elisha, and all the miracles they did, they always responded to the voice of God and they did something. They either spoke or they acted in a way. Okay. Whatever God told them to do, they obeyed. When you become obedient to all the ways God speaks to you, you've opened yourself up as a vessel through which He will work. Mm -hmm. And you think you don't qualify to be that vessel that He works through? Don't believe that lie. <laughs> First of all, you say, okay, God, where'd that light come from? I don't believe he'll ever use me for that. He'll show you where that light comes from. Yeah. And he'll help you get rid of that lie. Because I'm telling you, God is looking for people through whom he can flow. Yeah. The church needs people who aren't just Sunday go meeting or Saturday go meeting or whatever night we go meeting. Not just people who go sit, come sit, listen and go. The church needs people who walk with God. And who respond to God. And who allow God to use them in mighty ways. In the most, in the craziest times. Mm -hmm. I tell people this, nobody, most people won't, won't probably really see a miracle. Because miracles never happen when you're comfortable. <laughs> miracles happen when you need a miracle. Mm -hmm. And you're very uncomfortable. You don't know what to do. That's when miracles come. If you haven't learned to listen to God, miracles won't come either because he'll always instruct you what to do. Yeah. yeah. Dreams or visions. Never a mystery, never confusing. People say, I had a dream. I don't, tell me what it... Well, I'm not an interpreter of dreams. But I tell you what, if your dream or your vision left you confused, it was not God. If your dream or your vision didn't automatically, you understood it and knew exactly what it meant, it's not God. Mm -hmm. God is not the author of confusion. People say, well, I had this dream and this, this took place and that took place. And, and I said, okay, well, that's kind of a wild dream. What does it mean to you? Well, I don't know. That's what I'm telling you. I don't know what it means. I said, well, it sounds to me like maybe you just had too much pizza before you went to bed. If you don't know what it means, it's not God. Mm -hmm. Well, somebody was telling me that this represented that. No, nah, don't get into that. That's, that's not God. Yes, sir? You can also use the feeling to stir though. Because of the dream, take that to God. You can, yep, he'll, you'll stir those feelings up. And if those fe uh, feelings bring you fear or anything else, you take that and talk to him about those feelings. 
He'll use dreams. He'll use those things to stir you up. Absolutely. Glad you mentioned that. But if you don't know what the memory meant, or the, the, the vision or the dream meant, and it brought nothing but confusion, I'd first of all ask God, Lord, why am I so confused? What was that all about? Where'd that come from? Because I tell you what, the source of nightmares and the source of those fearful things that are, are always subconscious memories, subconscious experiences you've had being stirred up for some reason. And that creates a dream. That creates a, a, a night time when your mind is working. See, your subconscious mind never quits. Right. It runs 24-7. Yeah. And so it's the source of a lot of night terrors or nightmares, whatever you, whatever you call it up here. I've heard people call them night terrors, nightmares, <laughs> bad dreams. You know, always talk to them about what you're feeling. He'll show you the calm. He'll show you the source of it, or he'll bring you into perfect peace. Yep. Right. And there won't be any more thoughts on your mind about it. Yep. Right. But when he speaks to you through dreams or visions, it's it's never a mystery, and it's always, or it's never confusing. Oh, another shameless advertisement. <laughs> Let's take a break. I think it's time to wind her down for a little bit. We're going to talk about abiding in Christ. We're going to talk about what God's speaking to you, but we'll do that after our break.